So far, Paul's journey was going well without as many challenges as there was the last time he had traveled through the towns of Derby and Lystra in what is now known as the country of Turkey. No one had tried to stone him or throw him into prison yet. And this time he had so far only traveled by land to get to Lystra, starting in Antioch down below. And although Barnabas was not with him anymore, he kept company with his friend Silas and recently a young believer named Timothy. And as they traveled towards Iconium and the Galatian city of Antioch, Paul and his friends soon came to rest at the furthest point in Asia, minor, that they had previously gotten to. Now, eagerly wanting to take the message of Jesus to as many people as possible, Paul opened the map and pointed westward of their position. And I can imagine him exclaiming, there are so many people east of here, west of here, dozens of villages and towns and cities, and after that across the sea is Greece and the rest of the Roman Empire. Silas, can you imagine how many will hear about Christ Jesus if we follow that route? Well, no doubt Paul had his eye on the west coast of modern Turkey, always seeking more and more people to talk to about Jesus. But the Bible tells us that in Acts 16, that for some unknown reason, the Holy Spirit stopped them from preaching in that populated area. Maybe God spoke to them in a dream, or perhaps a friend influenced God and told them not to go. Maybe they had a direct conversation with an angel blocking the way. We don't know. We just know that God told them, don't go there. We know that they trusted the Holy Spirit and they headed northward instead, where there wasn't really that many people that they were passing by. However, days into their journey north, they saw signs up ahead of the populated region of Bithynia. So you can imagine Paul once again wanting to head in that direction, knowing that there's all these towns and cities and people groups, but the Bible says again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So... Paul, Silas, and Timothy headed towards the northwest coast to get to the city of Troas. Paul finally gets to speak at Troas. So what was so special about Troas? Well, scholars believe it's where Paul would meet a man by the name of Luke, the man who would help him write most of the New Testament. Today, I will attempt to answer a question that I've been asked many times in my life. How do you know whether or not the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something? Now, I want to be straightforward in highlighting that I have said I would attempt to answer the question. It would be foolish of me or anyone else to claim that they fully understand how the Holy Spirit works. And while I believe that I've been led by the Spirit many times in my life, and I know people who've been led by the Spirit many times, still, I have always found it difficult to explain how I knew it was the Holy Spirit and how the whole mechanics worked. In 1 Corinthians 13, if we can... Make this work. Awesome. Whoop, that's a bit too far. Whoop. There we go. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Paul briefly talks about how little we understand about how things work in regard to God and the world. In verse 12, he says, Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, when Jesus returns, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely.
completely. And that was Paul, who knew a lot about how God worked. He still said, I don't really understand. So I am unapologetically going to share with you how things seem to work when it comes to hearing from the Holy Spirit. But as Paul says, until Jesus comes, we don't really have the full picture. Now, when looking through the Bible and reflecting on my life and hearing the stories of other people's lives, there seems to be two ways and many methods of how God speaks to people. The two ways are either directly or indirectly. God either speaks to someone one-on-one or he speaks to someone through something else or someone else. Now, when it comes to the methods of how the Holy Spirit reaches people, there are far, far too many ways to speak of. I've had some people tell me in ministry, oh, no, you need to do ministry this way. Rubbish. The Holy Spirit does not like to be put into a box. There are so many, God will always use whatever method will suit best to the person he's trying to reach. Whether it's getting something through the Bible itself, or a gut feeling or impression that you have, or maybe it's using something strange to get someone's attention, or meeting someone new, or a friend or family member says something weird that gets your attention. In the Bible, God has used everything from writing words on a wall, to sending angels, to having unexpected conversations with donkeys, even a still small voice. Now for our family, there's been a variety of ways that God has gotten our attention. He hasn't even used the same method when it comes to us. Many times we've often felt a strong sense of importance or urgency regarding a specific decision that we either were already wrestling with or maybe something that we weren't even thinking of and suddenly it just lands on our lap. I remember back when Jodine and I lived in Victoria. This is going back a good 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Samuel was only about six or seven months old at the time. I was running a high school science department, and we had been living in a nice house that we had designed ourselves. And our lives weren't perfect, but we had a pretty good setup. That being said, we were finding things hard as new parents. We had only just sat down for a very late tea after spending quite a bit of time trying to get Samuel to go to bed. And after talking for a bit, Jodine sat down and she just said to me, it'd be nice to live closer to family so we could get some help. And before I knew what was happening, words started coming out of my mouth. And I said, well, let's just move up north then. I was like, what? And I'm sure I looked shocked when I said it because it was not what I intended to say. And Jodine looked at me with an equally shocked face and said, okay, let's move then. To which I said, okay, and then it was done. And we both sat at the table shocked that we had just had this conversation and we had just made this decision. We later felt as though God had just hijacked our mouths as it was definitely not something that either of us were planning. So a question worth asking is, well, why would God do that? Why does the Holy Spirit attempt to communicate with us? Doesn't he have other things to do? Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Let me say that the overall function and action and primary mission of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to God. That's the the number one mission of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to communicating with human beings, there are a few main reasons why God talks to us. So main reasons. The first one. The main one of the reasons is to give us and others eternal salvation 
and to help us to live a better life. You are all here in church or you're listening at home to this sermon because the Holy Spirit has influenced you to do so. Maybe you're not even a believer in God and you've just came here. Well, I believe that you're here because the Holy Spirit talked to you into coming and listening. You see, your spiritual well-being is one of God's priorities. He created you, sent Jesus to die for you, to redeem you. And God is making a place for you in heaven because he sees you as his child. God also wants other people to be saved as well. This is why all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you've looked in the Bible and you've looked in the New Testament and you see this, these lists sometimes that, God, that Paul writes down about the gifts of the Spirit, every gift of the Spirit is about helping other people to know who Jesus is. That's the whole point of all the gifts of the Spirit. Don't let someone tell you that the gifts of the Spirit is to, to show how important an individual is because they have a certain gift. That's not what it's for. That's glorifying yourself. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are to bring glory to God and to tell people who God is. The various gifts of the Spirit is to bring awareness of who God is to other people and to improve their well-being, both on this world and afterwards. He gives some people the gift of healing. And yes, I do believe that healings take place. He does this not only for other people's well-being, but he does it so that people will know where true love and true power comes from. He gives some people the gift of wisdom and discernment so that people will benefit from it, as well as knowing that wisdom comes from Christ. The Holy Spirit uses the scriptures to help us see things in the Bible that we've never noticed before. Things that are personal in nature. Once again, to show us that God cares about us so much that he even thought about each of us as the Bible was being written. So God communicates with us to give us and others eternal salvation and to help us live a better life. Another reason. To keep us or others safe in one way or another. I remember being told a story by my mom, who's probably watching. Hey. Um, my grandmother, her mother, when she was young, so this is going back probably 100 years ago, my grandma was walking home through a snowstorm at the time, which... For those who don't know, I'm guessing most of you because you're Australian, snowstorms are very, very treacherous. It's, it's what cyclones are in Canada. Okay, They're very treacherous, not only regarding to the cold, but snowstorms and blizzards are really treacherous because they stop you from being able to see things. You, there's so much snow being blown at you that you can't see where you're going. Tons of accidents happen during snowstorms. People get locked in homes because the, snow, the wind blows snow against doors and all sorts of things. They're, they're actually, they're fun, but they're, they're scary at the same time. So as my grandma was walking towards a wooden footbridge, and it was wood with ropes, it was a long time ago, like I said, she was going across this footbridge to cross a creek to head home. During a snowstorm, this figure walked towards her, told her not to use the bridge as it was out. And as she turned to thank the person as they passed by, they disappeared into the blizzard. Didn't see who it was or anything. She later found out that if she had used this pedestrian bridge, she would have likely fallen to her death as there the spaces where the wooden panels were were completely broken, and she wouldn't have been able to see that. She later believed that the figure had been an angel, but whether it was an, an actual angel or if it was just a caring human being, what was for sure was that God used them to communicate a life-saving message to her. So the Holy Spirit also communicates to us about our own well-being, 
and also the well-being of other people. But I believe it's the third reason that most people are curious about. And it's this third reason why I've actually had people say, tell me, can you please explain how you know the Holy Spirit was getting you to do things? And this is it. To help us make decisions. We all want to know what decisions we should make. We all wish that God would just... We, we had the, what the high priest had, the, the Urim and Thurim, where we could go, hey God, should I purchase that car or is it dodgy? And have it go, ding, yes, you should. Or ding, no, find someone else. We wish we had that. Most people want God to make things very clear to us when it comes to our decisions. Now, in the beginning, we talked about this in the youth Sabbath school. In the beginning, God would speak openly to Adam and Eve. Just as if we were having a chat, going for a walk, Adam and Eve actually would walk side by side next to God, who would actually talk to them just as if you were talking to me and I was talking to you. Could you imagine how amazing that would be? Just being able to talk to God and not wondering if it is really God or not. There was clarity and there was a two-way conversation. But all of that ended when sin came into the picture because sin separates us from God. Sin makes it so that we can't see things clearly and it's not because God's not there. Just like when the sun goes behind the clouds, the sun is still there. Sin makes it so that we have a hard time hearing from God, seeing God, knowing what to do. And the more we sin, the more we slip into things, the bigger the barrier becomes. And it's not because God doesn't want to talk to us. It's often because sometimes we're, we're busy, we're distracted. We think about things happening in our life. God's trying to get our attention, but like somebody who is deaf, having someone try to yell at you doesn't always work really well. Maybe we're on our phones and we're not noticing all the things. I wonder if it was much easier to know about when God was talking to us back 50 years ago when we didn't really have much technology and you sort of came home and maybe you read the newspaper and you didn't really have much else to do. We have so many things distracting us. But sin is what makes it difficult for us to know whether God's talking to us or not. During the Exodus period, God actually tries to talk directly to the Israelites. At the base of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up, he gets the tablets, he comes down, and God actually clears his throat and he starts telling the Israelites, Thou shall have no other gods before me. And they're like, ah! they're like, they're like covering and on the ground and they're like freaked out. Because God's voice sounds like thunder. It sounds like trumpets blaring. And they know it's God speaking. But because the people are, are so sinful, because they're human beings. Moses was a human being, but he spent a lot of time with God. So it tended to not affect him as much. But the people were so sinful, it made them terrified of God hearing this voice. God was so pure and so powerful and so the people actually went to Moses once they composed themselves and God stopped talking. They came to Moses and they begged him, can God just talk to you and then you tell us what he says? It, we can't handle this. He's just, he's just too big, too amazing for us. You have good men in the Bible, prophets like Isaiah and John the disciple who hung out with Jesus who they could barely stand up when they actually come into the throne room of God. They fall on the ground like dead men. And these are, these are God's prophets. These are people who probably are very, very good. Not very much sin on them. But they, in proximity where God is, they fall down because of sin. And so the sinfulness of humanity has made it very difficult for us to approach God. And because of that, it's sometimes hard for us to clearly know what he wants us to do. But he's given us a few things to help us to get close to him so we can hear him better. He's given us the Bible and he's given us prayer. 
When we spend time reading and meditating on the Word of God, we get to know His ways, and it rubs off on us, and we stop doing some of the things that cause the barrier between us. And when we go to God and we ask forgiveness, once again, this clears away the sin. And when we try to keep ourselves open to His leading, even though, and there's going to be lots of times God's going to tell you things, and it's not going to be things you're going to be very happy about. If we keep ourselves open to what He says, He does try to get our attention to help us to make decisions. Well, what kind of decisions does the Holy Spirit help us with? Does he help us with choosing what flavor of ice cream we want? Not really. He doesn't really care about those decisions. He wants us to actually be able to make some decisions on our own. But the easiest decisions that he helps us make is moral decisions. Number one, people have talked about their conscience. Have you heard that in movies and TV shows and books? Oh, my conscience doesn't want me to do that. That's God. Conscious and pressing them not to do the wrong thing. Let me tell you right now that if you get an impression in your head to do something that aligns with the Bible or tells you not to do something that's not good, you've actually heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. I have people tell me, Christians have been Christian their whole life, who say, oh, God doesn't talk to me. He does talk to you. Whenever you get an impression not to do something that you shouldn't, that's actually God. He's actually talking to you in that moment. Most moral decisions that we have are pretty simple to know the right answer to. Don't steal. Okay? Don't kill that person, even though you might want to. Okay? They're fairly simple. Sometimes we don't want to listen to them, but they're fairly simple. Well, the impression to do the right thing is the Holy Spirit talking to you. Of course, there's some decisions where the moral issue is is tougher to figure out, but God will still help us to make the best decision. Every day, the Holy Spirit is impressing us how to make the right moral choices all the time. He even does this with people who don't even believe in God. God's Holy Spirit talks to them as well about doing what is right. Every culture in the world, whether they're Christian or not, whether they've heard about God or not, every culture in the world has this idea of what is right and what is wrong. That's because God talks to everyone. The question is, are people willing to listen to what he has to say? The second kind of choice we would like help with is what I call life changers. The biggest life changer that we can make is one that the Holy Spirit is always happy to help us with, and that's to accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord. I would think that most people are here or listening online because they listen to the Holy Spirit about such a choice. Other big life choices might be around career decisions or relationship decisions. Last week, I was blessed to go to Kim and Haynes' wedding, where they made a big decision to get married. So let's actually, let's stop. Let's give them a hand for... They're hiding, hiding at the back, hoping not to have a lot of ruckus about them, but sorry. Um, we want to celebrate with you. Other big decisions like where to live or whether or not to make a large purchase, like a business decision. There have been times where God seemed to let our family know what he wanted us to choose when it came to life choices. Let me tell you a story. I remember when we were contemplating the idea of me doing further study when I was a teacher. The year before this event took place, I had actually been accepted into Monash University to do an MPhil and hopefully a PhD. But since we had left, we had since left Melbourne and we had moved to the central coast of New South Wales. And for some reason, later on I knew the reason why, but for some reason, none of the local universities were interested in the topic that I wanted to do. 
And at the time, I didn't feel like I was supposed to study at Avondale. So we wondered about this for months. And one Friday evening, Jodine and I were watching Louis Giglio. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Great preacher. Um, He was preaching on the topic of going where God asks you to go. And he was talking about the journey of Abraham and the journey of Moses. And he he had mused about the conversation between Moses and and God when Moses said, "Who? what should I tell people? What is your name? And God said, I am that I am. And Louis mused that, in a sense, God's name in English was the word be, B-E, because to be means to exist. That's what it means to I am, means ever existing. Well, at the end of this sermon... Jodine had a somewhat fearful look on her face. And I was like, it was a good sermon, wasn't it? And she was like, and I was like, what's wrong? But she didn't want to tell me what was wrong. And she finally told me after a bit of, like, what do you mean you don't want to tell me? Like, what, what's going on? She told me that during the sermon, she felt like God had spoken to her about my future studies. And she said, God sort of gave this, put this message in her head, you need to think bigger, think America. And then God told her that she had to tell me that. Well, Jodine wasn't happy about that. She didn't want to tell me because she didn't want to go to America. We had finally just moved closer to family. Well, I was stunned. I didn't really want to go either. And I said to her, the U.S., Go and study in the United States. You mean somewhere like Andrews University? To which Jodine said, what's Andrews? Is that in the U.S.? And so I was like, oh, well, yeah, it's like the flagship university. And so after telling her about where Andrews was and what it was, we were both shocked. We didn't want to go. And so we said, okay, let's just stop the conversation right now. Let's sleep on it. And we went and we, had, we slept on it and we went to church the next day because it was Sabbath. And as we got ready to go to church with one-year-old Samuel in our car with us, it was a, we were chatting. We were like, oh, let's put some music on. We put the music on. We put the stereo on. And suddenly, blaring from the, the stereo was the song, Yankee Doodle went to town and... And if you don't know, that's about the U.S. And so we were like, glam, slam on the stereo. We were like, and so we just, I don't think we said anything when that happened. Those, don't you love kids' CDs? Um, in the church, uncomfortably. That only part of the world, part of the word beautiful came up, leaving everyone to see the word B, B-E, come on the screen. The screen was frozen with the word B for several minutes as the AV team tried to figure out what was wrong. And if you remember, the night before, the sermon that we listened to talked about God's name and joked about, well, God's name is actually B, to exist. Well, B was on the screen for two minutes straight with the AV team flailing, trying to figure out what's wrong with this thing. But there was no one in church including the scrambling AV team, who was more uncomfortable in those two minutes than Jodine and I. We looked at each other like, what's going on? It's, it's not even supposed to say B, and it's saying B on the screen. And we had this shrinking feeling that God was trying to confirm that, yes, indeed, he wanted us to leave Australia Fair and move to the USA. Let me assure you, that God is interested in our lives and your lives. Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow. And that if God clothes the grass in a beautiful jasper color, and the lilies in pure white, even more beautiful than, than the King Solomon's rich robes, only to be thrown into the fire, then God is most certainly going to help us with our everyday needs and our decisions. Now, the question on most people's minds is, well, how do we know whether it's God speaking to us 
or not? Whoops. This is a question that I wrestle with several times a year, particularly when trying to make a good decision. Let me start by saying I don't believe that God is going to give us the straight answer to every decision that we make, including the big ones. My view on this has changed somewhat in the last year or two because of different experiences that we had. I think that God wants to bless us no matter what choices we make. But there are some choices, let me just hide that for a sec, there are some choices that will result in more blessings than others. Jodine and I could have ignored God about going to Andrews University. And I think he would have, okay, I'll just leave it. But I think that God would have blessed us even if we chose not to go to Andrews. But I think because he seemed to go out of his way, and I didn't even tell you all the things that happened that week when we were floored with this really weird idea of going overseas. I didn't tell you everything. That's just a little bit. I think because God went out of his way to tell us what he wanted us to do, there was more blessings to be had by following that specific choice. I probably would never have gone into pastoral ministry if I didn't go to Andrews. I wasn't planning to go into pastoral ministry. I didn't even want to go into pastoral ministry. And it all just happened while I was at Andrews. And that would have had a ripple effect on many experiences that we have had since, also impacting many people that we have met along the way. However, in the past few years, I've come to believe that there are some decisions that God is silent about where he doesn't actually say anything about them. And it's not because he doesn't care about those decisions. It's just because I think there's some choices where he just wants us to make the choice. Where he's saying, you know what? It's your life. I want you to just pick whichever one you want. called to after studying for four years it was the third place the first place would have been a great place to me to go career wise at least as an academic and we wondered if it was God's will but in the end we felt as though God was just not saying anything and as though God just sort of said it's up to you guys I don't mind we felt surprised that we were released to make this decision without any sign from him because it was very different to some of the other things that had happened in the previous years. So we made the decision not to take that position. And we're very glad we didn't take it, especially with what happened this year and also meeting all of you. It would be six weeks before we got another call. And when we did, we had two to choose from. And we felt as though God let us choose that time. And we felt Springwood was the best choice for our family. We were like, well, God's just letting us make whatever choice. He's not showing any preference. So let's go, let's go with Springwood. And we're glad we're here. So how do you know it's Him? How do you know it's God? The methods that God uses to talk to us are endless. Maybe you get a strong impression to do something. Maybe God actually speaks. That's cool. Maybe someone tells you something, or God writes his answer in the sky. I don't know if the other day you saw an airplane writing actually a Bible text in the sky. That was, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So how do you really know if it's him? There's four things that I've sort of felt helps you to know whether it's God or not. Actually, there's a fifth one. I forgot to give you that one, Bryce. Sorry. Came in at the last minute. 
Um, <laughs> and actually, I've, I've changed the way what, a couple of them are written. Let me just, let's just forget this. I'm going to tell you verbally what they are, because I've changed this sermon several times in the last 12 hours, because I felt God wasn't quite happy with it. The first one is, does it align with Scripture? Okay, does it align with Scripture? If you're impressed to do something that goes against what the teaching of the Bible says, it's likely not from Him. It's, it's not from Him. Sometimes people often who end up in psych wars will say, God told me to da 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 And it's like, the Bible goes against that, that that was not God telling you to do that. The second one, um, which is different to what's up on... Oh, good, it's not up on the screen for them. The second one is, does it bring you closer to God? If you were to make that decision, would it bring you closer to God if you did? If a decision comes into your head and you feel impressed that God wants you to do something, if it's actually a decision that will take you further from God, or it puts the things that God values to the side, like if it's something that's going to destroy your family, that's not something that God's going to want you to do. It's probably not from God. The third one, and my apologies, it's not up on the screen. The third one is, will I be stretched? If it's something that does not involve you growing as a person, or being stretched, if it's just you having this comfy job, you get paid lots of money, you don't really have to do anything, it's probably not God. If it involves being stagnant, it's probably not from Him. Um, God, rare, I, don't, I don't think you can find a Bible reference where you have God says, I want you to make tons of money and have a life of luxury. That's not really a God kind of answer, is it? That's more something that the devil might want you to do. That's not to say that God doesn't want you to make money, but he, what, he might want you to use that money to help other people. And the fourth one is, what will be sacrificed? If there is a sacrifice of things that God values, again, like, if I take this job, my marriage is probably not going to do really well, or if I move to that place, it's not going to be good for me spiritually. It's probably not from Him. But if, there, if it involves the sacrifice of worldly things, if I take this job, I'm going to have to give up some of the things I really like to do. Well, that could be God. Maybe He wants you to spend more time with Him. And the fifth one, is basically one of the ways to confirm it is seek godly counsel. Although there are occasions where God may ask you to go against the decisions of everyone else, the Bible still advises to seek confirmation from God-fearing, wise people. Um, there are certain people in my life where if something big is happening, I will write to them and say, hey, I feel like this is what God wants. What do you think? And, of course, there are some people in my life where I would never ask them <laughs> what they think about it because I know they're, they're not going to be thinking in terms of, of God. You're not going to offend God by seeking clarity from Him. Thank you very much. Very helpful. So does it align with Scripture? Does it bring you closer to God? Will I be stretched what will be sacrificed, and finally seek godly counsel. There's very likely things that are happening in your life right now where you're wanting to find out, what should I do? And perhaps, I'd say it's very likely that there's at least a couple people here where God's trying to get your attention and trying to point you towards a certain decision it's all likely that the decision that God wants you to make is probably not a decision that makes you very comfortable. God usually doesn't tell us, stay home 
and have some ice cream. <laughs> he usually tells us to go and do something that aren't, that's uncomfortable, but it's for his glory. And I know that there's some people here who are wrestling with some ideas, maybe things that will take you far away, maybe things that will bring you closer to him, but it might mean you have to give up something. It's my prayer that God is going to help make things very clear to you. Can I recommend praying more about it, spending time in the scripture, having a think about it? Look at these things. Is it, is it something he would want you to do? Is it something that's going to bring him glory? Something that's going to make you a stronger Christian? Or maybe something that's going to bring other people to God? I hope you have some friends who are godly. If not, can I encourage you to try to build some relationships with some people, maybe here at church or wherever you are. If you're, if you're watching from online, I'm sure that there's some people you could reach out to where you are. If not, try asking your local church. I'm going to have a prayer with you now as we close up. But know that God cares about you. He does care about the decisions that you're trying to make. And if God's not saying anything to you about it, and you are spending time in the Word, maybe God doesn't mind the decision that you make. Let's bow our heads now as we finish up. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you love us and that you sent the Holy Spirit, part of yourself, to guide us, to keep us safe to bring us to e eternal salvation. Thank you that you, you help us with the decisions that we need to make. We just ask that you would help just be more clear, particularly when we're crying out to you. Help us to have the courage to choose to do the things you're nudging us towards, even if they feel uncomfortable to us, even if it means that we're not going to get to do the things that we, we like to do instead do the things that you want us to do. I pray specifically for the people who are here today who may be feeling like you're asking them to do something, whether it's in regards to a business decision, maybe it's in regards to um, a relationship they have with someone, maybe it's in regards to a job or even a family member having a hard conversation. I ask that you would please help them to know what you would like them to do. And if it's something that you're happy for them to just make the choice themselves, then help them to have peace with that. Thank you so much for all you're doing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.